It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Well, aloha. Thank you so much for joining us here on Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yenji Denise. Ryan Kalei is traveling with the UH men's volleyball team, so uh, he's on the road with them, but he will be back on Monday. In the meantime, we've got a great guest for you today. Dr. Scott Miskovich of Premier Medical Group is joining us now. Uh, you've been a frequent guest of ours throughout the pandemic, and we are so lucky to have you this morning. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, certainly anytime, Yenji. Um, still still living every day um, dedicated to uh, helping the people of Hawaii and across the country uh, with COVID. Yeah, and let's focus in on COVID. Where, how do you think we're doing as a state when it comes to the virus? Uh, you know, when you see the positivity rate, it is so hard for me to understand those numbers and to put them into context because so many people are doing these home tests. So, you know, when you look at those percentages, when you see the numbers from the Department of Health, how do you read them? Uh, once again, it's um, we all know it's undercounted, and the further along we get, the further undercounted it is. Uh, nothing that the Department of Health can do or the state can do about it, and we'll talk more about this, but I think most of this tracks back up to the federal government. But right now, we did uh, talk about when there was enough data that what the number is and what the multiple is that's truly out there. I still think there's probably what it was before, six to 10 times higher numbers that uh, are in our state than we're actually seeing counted, mainly because of the home test. And Yanji, we have a new phenomenon, which is no tests. People are not testing whatsoever. They'll get symptoms and you know there's not as many free tests out there and they basically just proceed on. And uh, so right now, I would say, you know, when we look at uh, the range of the 900 to 1200 over the last three weeks, you know, we're probably still ranging anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000. And so that's probably 800 on up to even a thousand a day. And I can also tell you, since I'm back in the office, uh, seeing patients, seeing long COVID, we also own the urgent care on the windward side, it is paralleling what we're seeing in walking through our doors. A lot more people are coming through with COVID and uh, a lot more people are sick. So it's unfortunate. Well, tell us about the patients that you are seeing. We know that the variants have changed over time. Um, and, you know, part of the reason it seems that people are not taking COVID as seriously is that they tend to get sick and then they get better. Uh, you know, and a lot of people say, well, I don't need to test. Uh, this is like the flu. What do you say to those folks and what what is the severity of infection that you're seeing in your office right now? Uh, there's two sides to the coin. And again, I know we'll 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 hone in on this more, but it goes to the over 60 and then take every decade above 70, 80 serious pneumonia, lungs, uh, more debilitating disease. And those are the people that have the likelihood of being a statistic in our hospital and unfortunately dying. And we're, we're seeing that comparatively in our true data that we're getting. Um, younger, basically a lot of it depends on you as an individual and your health status. And you know, we, we don't talk enough about what are the other risks that CDC identifies, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, any kind of lung disease, uh, those are really key. And of course, our immunosuppressions, anybody has cancer on certain medications, you know, you can be younger, but if you're in those categories and let's face it, weight is a very um, uh, unknown because 40% of our country is overweight and we have a little more skewed uh, overweight in certain demographics, you're, you're still at risk. You have to be serious. On the other hand, as per all the data, younger kids, teens, 20s, 30s, perfectly healthy, your risk is pretty low, uh, but there's still the unknowns. 
right? And we do live in a community, so you might be okay, but grandma might not. Let's talk about uh, a recent move made just in the last few days, FDA and CDC making a change in the vaccine allowances for a booster of the bivalent vaccine. What can you tell us about this decision, who it affects, and what kind of a conversation you suggest folks now start to have with their doctors? This is huge, and uh, it's something that we need to be, again, standing on the rooftop shouting and putting plans into play across the country. This was anticipated. I think in some of my news times and TV times, I was kind of saying, expect this to come, and I was getting a lot of questions in the office. Essentially, the FDA approved following day, CDC approved that at six months since you've had your bivalent, you are now eligible over the age of 65, anyone over 65, if your bivalent was six months ago or longer, you can now get another shot. And they also have a category for immunosuppressed, which I just discussed, other at risk, which I just discussed. And there's a very good caveat sentence in there that says, and per your provider's discretion, so it does leave it up to the treating medical providers to make a decision with their patients based on, based on their health risk to get that next vaccine. Now, why those categories? Well, one, we just talked about, Yanji, those are the people who are being hospitalized and dying. Now, why are those people being hospitalized and dying since they have a higher percentage of even having their first bivalent, let alone a very high percentage of having the earlier vaccinations? Well, plain and simple, the older we get, the less active our immune system is. We don't hold on to that immunity as long. And so when we do the studies, looking at each decade as you go, you have waning immunity. And after that shot, you get a nice big burst and you get that iron dome over you protecting you, but it fades versus when you're younger. Gee, some of the younger groups, when we looked at the vaccinations, uh, comparing to the older groups, they had more immunity at three months versus when they started. They were, I mean, it was just robust immune response. So the key is we have waning immunity. People are probably tired of hearing that. And that is the key to why we're seeing the resurgence of COVID in different areas because even you know people that are younger, you'll still get waning immunity, but that is the key to boost the immunity. The good news is it's the Omicron bivalent. Now, let me highlight the Omicron bivalent too. Half of the Omicron uh, bivalent is the original vaccine. The other half is a new Omicron specific vaccine. And so a lot of people don't realize they're still getting what they got in the original. One of the statements that came out effective yesterday is that the old vaccine, the original, is in the trash. We are all told to destroy it. It is no longer available. So any vaccination, even if you're deciding, all right, I'm going to get my first, you will get the bivalent vaccination. That's all there is available, both Pfizer and Moderna bi bivalent. From my perspective as a treating provider, love it because the Omicron-specific uh, vaccine that's been added is very effective to what we're seeing right now and mains effectivity. You know, what's interesting is that the uh, CDC has indicated that there will likely be a new COVID vaccination that comes out in the fall uh, in conjunction, perhaps, with the flu vaccine and so or the flu shot. And I think a lot of folks are just waiting for that. They say, oh, I'll just wait. You know, it's it's not that far away from now. It's about what, let's say, you know, they usually start to come out around, I think, August, September, um, so, you know, maybe October. So what do you say to those folks who say, I'll just put it off until then and get the two for one. Don't, don't wait. Um, uh, and, and if you're in that category, the reason there is an approval is because there's significant evidence that will show that it's going to help keep you from developing a pneumonia or being uh, infected with a severe disease, hospitalization and death. The data is crystal clear. You're gonna get up into the mid eighties or more to prevent those two things from happening. 
uh, don't wait. And I'm sure we'll touch on this, but it's because also we have another surge of a variant that's not, it's, it, it's hit our shores, but it's starting to hit the United States coming out of India and Singapore and it's starting to evade even the, the most recent immunity. So there now is the time to get it before we get this surge. Don't wait because again, why six months? We just talked about it. You have waning immunity right now. The other thing I can say is the individuals who have never had any type of bivalent and maybe just got the first two shots you're don't walk around like you feel like you oh i've got my vaccine that's pretty much gone you know that's that's bygone era so you know you might have a smidge left over from that but you need to get updated just like you know you don't get one flu shot and then five years later get another one thinking that you're protected um to go on to answer your other question we um we we've been given this and i'm fortunately connected all over the country and even the world now with what i've done and my cnn connections um we were told that basically the discussion for a fall variant uh or fall vaccine for covid will be now merged into the same committee at the fda that discusses what is in the flu vaccine Here's a little point that hopefully calm people and give them some education. Every year, a committee meets that discusses all the research and data of what the flu types are circulating around the world, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, which flu season is opposite of ours. And they choose four variants to be put into the flu vaccine. So every year when you get a flu shot, there's two A's and two B's. Those are selected based on data and, and um, uh, prediction and information that has been going on for years and years. And in June, they make the final decision from all the research that's been gathered prior of what the makeup will be for the flu vaccine that comes out, as you said, August, September. Well, now they merge that meeting to say, let's talk, to COVID, talk about COVID at the same time. The discussion was, following the same logic and trending that they will look at what are the variants of COVID and then decide if they may need to make a new COVID vaccine that then would be produced and given at the same time in the fall. All indication we have right now and all the intelligence gathering that we have, uh, and this was reaffirmed the last two days, is the bivalent is likely going to be it because it's working and fortunately, we still have the Omicron type variants that it addresses that we're predicting. So anticipate that we will find out in June that the COVID vaccination that is available now will be available to the entire population of the United States, along with your flu shot that could be given at the same time in August, September. And don't wait if you're in the risk group, but the rest of the population, you're going to be able to get it. You did mention variants coming to our shores. What can you tell us about what you're tracking globally and what we need to keep an eye on? Uh, number one by a long shot is um, XBB.1.16, uh, the biggest uh, uh, country we're tracking, you know, which same country that uh, we tracked to see Delta coming out of, which of course was devastating, uh, but the uh, XBB.1.6 is coming out of India. And uh, the trending out of India right now is extraordinarily significant where uh, the hospitalizations are up 900%, uh, deaths are, or deaths are up 900%, hospitalizations are up 675%. Uh, the disease is doubling every five days. It's spreading throughout the country. And um, it has at least eight different mutations on the spike, remember, that's the place where the COVID uh, virus finds a way to get around the immu uh, immunity that we have from the prior infection or vaccination. Uh, one or two of those are similar to what was on Delta and that those variants are making it immune evasive. So uh, basically 
that is the big concern. We're following it. Uh, we just had our variant report released by the state of Hawaii. We have this variant now on the Big Island and Kauai. Uh, so it's arrived on our shores. Remember, those variant reports are roughly three uh, weeks old. Uh, we're I'll, I'll check the update, but it's probably 35 states now. It's arrived. It's already in a very short period of time, doubling every five days in the United States. And it's already up to our second most common variant, still below 10% or so, but it's really spreading rapidly. Uh, it still is an Omicron um, variant. So we still do have protection if you've been vaccinated. That's, that's why I was emphasizing get your vaccinations. Um, we have another one that we're, we're watching, uh, it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3 are the two decimals after it, that's showing some of the same things. But, um, you know, that's, this isn't done, Yanji. This is not done. This is not endemic. We're still in pandemic. And even if you track back to uh, some of the other prior flus in history, we had six, eight, ten years of little bumps. And we had uh, the couple big bumps and then a quiescent period and then a couple of other big spikes. So when I talk to my patients in the office and when I'm on all of my media time, it's like, don't throw your masks away. You know, it's, you know, keep your masks. And we're focusing now down to very specifics. That's 65 to, uh, you know, older age group very, very specific, common in certain things, and risk and immunosuppressed. Well, you mentioned masks, and, I, you know, there's a there's a little discussion going on in the comments right now. Uh, you know, the, these two ladies are arguing back and forth right now about, yes, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. It's something that we see, you know, being played out uh, in a number of discussions. Where are you when it comes to mask wearing? When do you suggest people use a mask? Uh, have, you said don't throw out your mask. So I'm assuming you still have one in well, your glove box and making your I, pocket. <laughs> I have one with me all the time. Um, boy, that is, it's black and white, uh, you know, that, that wearing a good fitting N95, KN95 will prevent you from getting the disease more than any other thing that you can do. And so now notice what I said, KN95, they're very, very inexpensive and very available. You can get them for about a buck. Notice the other comment. And I beefed on our government at the federal level for years on, on my national, international television is why are we teaching people more of how to wear them? Because I'll tell you, I see so many people not wearing them correctly. And so, so that's key. Find a good mask, find the ones that you can wear correctly, and they work. Secondarily, wear. Think about poor ventilation areas that you're going to be there for any period of time. And think about when you're going to be close to people where you can be breathing in their air. That's it's it's same thing that it was two and a half years ago. That hasn't changed. That's where the masks could be. Think about where the trade winds move. Um, I still wear them in Safeway. I do my informal my informal um, um, study, and that's my Safeway Safeway mask count. I'll go in there and. I've been counting the number of people I'll see with masks, and sometimes I'm the only one in there still wearing a mask. And, you know, it just seems like it's gone straight down. But please, you know, um, and oh, here's another one. I want to harp on this one. I am mm, the federal government, you know, with their dropping of the emergency proclamation, it's translated over now where they also caveated that all hospitals are not required because there was a hospital specific mask requirement since they take federal funds. It's dropped. All of our hospitals are following the same guideline where you don't have to have a mask in hospital. Okay. My office, we will give you a mask. You have to wear a mask because doctors offices and hospitals have people that are potentially ill at the same time. We have people that are well, and, and we all have to share in this to protect each other. And so I'm just concerned that our own hospitals are once again going to become a breeding ground for COVID transmission 
because they just dropped the mask um, proclamation. Wow, that's very interesting. Let's we've focused a lot of our conversation thus far on prevention. Let's talk about what happens if you are, you know, unlucky enough to catch the virus. Uh, what about the antiviral treatments? What about Paxlovid? What are you suggesting for people when it comes to treating COVID once you do test positive? Treat, 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 and treat. Take it. I prescribe it on a regular basis, and the data and background around it is terrific, and it works. And you are, we're still getting more confirmation, 85% chance if you take Paxlovid, you've reduced your personal, based on your personal risk of hospitalization and close to, and death. So the, from what it came out and what the original studies show, they have been confirmed with the ongoing treatment. Um, so from my perspective, Please, again, if you are especially in those at-risk group, if there's any question, over 50, everyone should be taking Paxlovid when you get when you get it. It's a five-day course. It comes in a blister pack. It's easy. The only main side effect is you might get a little metallic taste in your mouth, and that's 10 or 15 percent of the people, which goes away. Um, we we now no longer have the the Paxlovid rebound as an issue. All we find is the same number of people will get some symptoms, you know, while they're on Paxlovid as people who get the disease. The disease, sometimes the virus does a little bit of this waviness. Um, so don't worry about what you're hearing about any of this quote unquote rebound. What you need to think about is preventing death and preventing hospitalization. And it's proven all over the world. It works. Uh, let's talk about how you go about getting that. Uh, so, and then there is a short window, right? In terms of, and that's why testing is so key. If you don't know yeah, if you have right. COVID or if you wait too long to convert, confirm it, uh, this drug may not have the same impact that you're talking about. So tell us about what those windows are. And, and what if you encounter a provider who says, oh, you're too young, you don't need it. I mean, you know, does a relatively healthy, you know, person, let's say, you know, 30s, 40s in that age range, would they also need to take that? Or is it really meant for people who are immunocompromised and, and a little bit older? Um, that group that it's not indicated don't have to take it. Okay, so the first one that you just described, if you're perfectly healthy and your weight's normal and you're younger, you know, and you have none of those risks, you don't have to take it. Um, and it's not indicated. I'm going to I'm going to mention something that's very important, though. Over 50, you're fine. You should. Doesn't matter. Healthy, not healthy, whatever. You should get it. Over There's, 50, because, you know, yeah. we tend to focus on over 65. You're saying over 50. Over 50 with Paxlovid. Now, I want to highlight that there is a big misconception, and it really bothers me that a lot of my colleagues haven't studied this enough, where a lot of the physicians say, well, you're on medication, so you don't have to work. You know what? There's about two or 300 medications that are listed for watch out for. Well, I can tell you from a 30 plus years experience, about 250 of those I've never even seen or had a patient on. They're very, very rare. And then when you start breaking down the categories of the medicines, there are, are medications that they basically say, reduce the dose. Big deal. For, for a week to reduce the dose, to, to cut it in half. Or there's other medications like, for example, um, a, a cholesterol medicine. You know what? Cholesterol medicine's for life. And if you're on Simvastatin and you just stop it for 10 days, there's no big deal versus saving the chance that you won't get hospitalized. So doctors really need to study what it is that you can do and what medicines and what the, what the real answer is. Yanji, I've had zero patients I've ever been not able to prescribe Paxlovid after studying their medications and studying what their diseases are with, you know, making the trade-offs. So it can be for everyone. Um, that's that's important. Uh, let's talk briefly about long COVID. What are you seeing? Uh, we know that, you know, an estimated 15 million Americans are suffering from long COVID. It's a multitude of symptoms, you know, really uh, hard to say, you know, we know the brain fog, the fatigue, joint pain, but it can actually be quite serious, debilitating even uh, for some folks. There doesn't seem to be, you know, there's no Paxlovid for long COVID, if you will. There's no treatment, you're just treating the symptoms, you're not actually treating uh, the core disease. So what are you seeing with long COVID and, and how do you think that's impacting our community? 
Um, correct. And as you as you're well aware, I think we have a, a whole show and more we could do for talking about long COVID, but uh, it's devastating. It really is devastating. Uh, it's real. I, I have so many patient scenarios that I could talk about that are these perfectly healthy, normal people, and it's just changed their lives where they have to sleep for an hour and a half twice a day, and they used to be able to run, and they're fatigued. And, you know, again, people dragging oxygen bottles around and and people who are normally so alert being able to be sharp. And there's really no single thing that we're doing, you know, there. I, I want to encourage people to get checked and followed up. And like I said, I have a whole, a whole clinic of people we're seeing with this, um, especially we have to focus on lungs, vascular, and brain and kidneys because some of the micro clotting that can occur uh, can have affected you in ways that these organ systems are very important and we can treat them. But unfortunately, some of the things that are so prevalent like the brain fog and the fatigue, um, there's just not a single answer. It's prevention uh, that is the key to not get it and, and again, we can talk a lot more about the specifics. One of the things I do wanna highlight um, for our population here, we, two more studies came out this week that talked about just normal people having COVID, the conversion and you're 50% or more, and there's about seven studies, some will show a lot higher, that you'll then convert to diabetes. So you could be a normal. Wait, 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 back up. Cause that's really important. Can, Very you, important. can you, can you explain that again? Okay. So if you have had COVID, you don't have to have long COVID. You just have to have COVID. You don't have to be hospitalized. You don't have to be older. You are going to be at a 50% risk within the first year of converting and developing diabetes. So we have done, I've done the data and confirmed it with, you know, kind of all the epi stats. We have right now with our numbers of people, 10 to 15,000 individuals in the state of Hawaii that are walking around diabetic after having COVID. And so you need to be mentioning to your doctor, you had COVID even if you don't feel. I've had patients that I've treated for 25 years, perfectly at weight, perfectly healthy, just saw one two days ago. And he was like, yeah, just one day, I, I didn't feel well, I came in, my blood sugar was 600. No one in my family have it, has it, it just, I just, now I'm diabetic. And I'm on insulin. And, you know, that's happening across the country. It's being confirmed also in the countries that we look to, which are Israel and Great Britain and some of the Scandinavian countries, which have great data collection. This is across the world. Um, that I, is that is very concerning because I think by now, if you haven't had COVID yourself, all of us know someone who has. So when we think about right. the numbers, the, the health impacts for that individual, and also, I mean, thinking farther out, just as a community, the financial impacts uh, for our healthcare system. You know, diabetes is obviously, as we know, uh, for often, oftentimes, is is lifelong. It, yeah. Um, Right. And and the likelihood is the way these people are presenting. This isn't just like a, a diabetes in pregnancy where it can be a transitory. No, this is because it affected your immune system. This is because that's the primary mechanism that long COVID, uh, you know, uh, attacks our system and attacks our body, but it affects our immune system and transitions over. And we have no answer. We've had $1.2 billion spent by the National Institutes of Health in the RECOVER trial. Uh, and it's been going on for two years. And you know what they've come up with? Zero. Zero. Zero answers. It's going on at major universities across the country. No answer for why and how we're going to prevent this. So, uh, yeah, that diabetes number is something that is really concerning because it, you know, and again, we could really talk more about long COVID because there are so many things in so many ways it prevents and changes lives. But it's real. If you're out there and you're listening, it's not fake. Brain fog's not fake. The extreme fatigue and the life-changing events these individuals are having where, you know, that they're, they're shut in and they can't walk around the street without stopping to get a breath, it's, it's devastating. 
Well, we are out of time. We could talk to you for hours, I think, especially with all the, the research that you're doing. So thank you for sharing all of that today. I just want to give you an opportunity to share a final message with the audience, especially in light of where we started our conversation, and that is on those bivalent boosters and the availability of that. What's your message to folks who are watching? Um, take your kapuna. I think, you know, I think I have a big message for everyone. The federal government has led the charge and their lead is we're done. You know, the, the emergency proclamation is over. We're done. Uh, they're making some funds available, but then the states are following the federal government's um, lead. And so it's up to us. It's back to where we started. It's us. To, it's up to us to fight the rest of COVID as individuals. And the first thing you can do is please help your kapuna because they are the ones that are in our hospitals right now. Our death numbers are going to increase. We saw 10 today. They're going to go up to 14, 16. Please take your elderly or anyone who is at risk to get that vaccination, get their masks, wear a mask if you think you have a chance of having COVID being around them because we're the ones that can bring it in. So please help them. All right, Dr. Scott Miskovich of Premier Medical Group, thank you so much for being here today. We always appreciate your perspective. Mm, thank you, Yanji. Thank you. Wow, great to hear from him. A lot of sobering news there. Uh, one of the big things, of course, that we started and ended our conversation with was talking about the FDA and CDC approving the bivalent booster for those who are immunocompromised or, or over 60. Uh, 65 rather, uh, and saying that really is the discretion of your physician uh, if you don't fall into those categories, if perhaps you do need uh, that booster. That's something, the conversation that you might want to have with your doctor. Dr. Scott Miskovich saying there, don't wait until the fall, that really his message is to mask up if you're in a crowded situation uh, in an area where you might not know the health status of those around you and might be sharing the same air, especially if, especially if you are in a poorly ventilated area. Uh, and if you are fall into one of those categories, make sure to get that bivalent booster. He also talked a lot about what should happen if you do contract COVID. He says that there's a lot of COVID in our community. You know, we see those uh, DOH statistics every week, but he estimates that we're six to 10 times higher when it comes to the actual number of people in our community who are walking around testing positive uh, for the virus. So he says test early. And if you do test positive and you're over 50 or you have uh, a, a immuno, you know, an immunity issue, to please talk to your doctor about getting Paxlovid. He says that that can make a huge difference in the outcome of the disease and that he says that that is really something that all doctors really need to be having conversations with their patients about. We always love having him on. If you missed any part of this conversation, you could, of course can watch it once uh, the live stream is POW or you can catch it as a podcast later to do it today or watch the rebroadcast on Channel 50. On Monday, Governor Josh Green is going to be joining us. Ryan will be back from covering volleyball and we always have a lot of questions for him. We'll be asking him about COVID and about everything that's happening at the legislature. Uh, he still doesn't have a fully approved cabinet, he has a lot of initiatives that he's pulling through. Session is coming to a close soon, and there is a lot of work happening behind the scenes. We'll ask Governor Josh Green about all of that, and we hope you join us then. Have a great weekend. Aloha.